It's time for Trench Talk, where Joe Rogan meets underground metal and heavy music. I'm your host, Flight of Icarus from MetalTrenches.com. As always, if you haven't already, please do subscribe to the channel, follow us on social media, sign up for the mailing list, and consider supporting us on Patreon or Subscribestar. Links to all that down in the description. You want to just start by introducing yourself and your band? Okay. I'm Ojo Bohr. I do a project called Botanist. Um, Botanist is safely the first band in the world to use distorted hammer dulcimers on stage and in <laughs> its uh, music. Um, the dulcimer has been adapted with magnetic pickups in order to practically be used as if they were guitars, but they're not, obviously. Um, it's a concept band about uh, plants and flowers, but uh, seen through the eyes of an insane botanist that has lost his mind at seeing the destruction of the natural world at the hand of man. And he retreats into his world of plants and solitude and waits for mankind to destroy itself. That way, the uh, earth can be repopulated uh, by flora and fauna and re re uh, regain a natural balance of utopia. That's quite a concept, and I'm sure you've talked about this before, but we have to start with, where did you come up with that? <laughs> like, where did that all come from? Well, I think it largely has to do with my obsession with black metal. Um, and the black metal I tend to be obsessed with is the foresty kind of black metal. Um, the, the stuff that talks has a lot of themes of being alone in the forest and connecting with nature. And nature is sort of a, a godlike entity that is to be feared and respected and isn't entirely understood. And that really echoes a lot of romantic, the romantic uh, period of literature and thought that I, I see a, a major parallel to that I also enjoy a lot. So it's coming from those places that um, I wanted to make my own band and it seemed like doing that about plants would be a really great thing to do. Um, it's, I've talked a little bit about semi being inspired by carcass in terms of the, uh, the way I see how they put together their records. Like they would, I, I just have this impression that they opened up a um, medical dictionary and just started writing songs about what they were <laughs> finding specifically about pathology. But, uh, but I said, why doesn't somebody do this about plants? It would be really cool. And, and, but how would it be metal? So then, then the whole apocalyptic aspect came about. So I think that's largely how I got into it. Um, and it was, it's something that I could really run with because sincerely, it's like all those elements about the foresty black metal, about being alone in the forest and connecting with nature and connecting with oneself and feeling one's place within the world and, and having sort of a reset, it hits a reset button. And I think a lot what those black metal albums that are sincerely talking about um, forced worship, that's what they're talking about. And it's not a new idea. It goes back to like, if you think about monasteries, about being in the forest of being secluded from people and how the monks, they would connect with God or themselves or, you know, um, and how that would be linked to that. Um, and, that's a sincere thing that I feel like going out. So it's like, I can make a band and it'd be about this. And no one's really done the plant thing to, to this degree. Like forests are all over the place in black metal, but plants is, is something else. So that's where it started. Yeah, that's true. It is interesting to think about that. A lot of like foresty imagery, but not quite to the degree that, that you're getting to with this. And you mentioned literature. I was curious, are there any like specific books or things that kind of stand out to you in terms of influences? Sure. Um, uh, William Blake, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, um, Lord Byron, and, uh, and Shelley are the ones that come to mind the most. Those are all romantic poets and, or writers, and uh, in some cases, artists as well uh, that come to mind. Um, to a lesser degree, I mean, I'm a big fan of uh, Edgar Allan Poe, so, um, and I find his writing to be very metal. <laughs> Definitely, uh, but, I think a lot of people would agree with you. 
Yeah, I mean, not all that, not everything that he wrote. I mean, his famous stuff. He wrote a lot of stuff that had nothing to do with right. his famous like persona. But in terms of being like the embodiment of doom metal, like it, it doesn't really get any more doom than than that guy's the way he writes and how like long winded and like plotting. But it doesn't. It just takes its time in like getting you to your doom. You just know you're going to get there. And it's we it's super weird along the way. You have only sort of an idea of what's going on the whole time, and you never understand to a hundred percent degree of what's happening. It's great, um, and I think it's it's very inspirational. So um, or reflective of being into metal anyway. So those are some some writers that I like a lot. And then regarding the hammered dulcimer, was that just something you were already playing, or how did that come into the fold? It kind of started because I'm a drummer and. I, my, my dream had always been to play drums in bands and I was trying to get that to happen and it sort of was, but only sort of in a, like a really nominal way. And the most that was, was going on that was actually achieved at the time is I was in a power violence band and we did a Japan tour and we put out like a small split on a small label in Japan and the band had existed before, but hadn't really done that much. It was, a, I mean, cult to the extreme of even want to give it that much cred so that's and then that sort of stopped and everything else wasn't really going anywhere and i wanted to be able to make records right away like i because i just have this ability to work and focus and just get do what i want to do um but it tends to happen a little easier when i'm by myself <clears throat> so i need to be able to play something that wasn't because I can't just make a whole album of drums. It'll be kind of a, a nightmare. So, um, Hammer Dulcimer was an instrument that was really easy for me to transpose my skill set to, and it didn't take that much practice to be able to just suddenly be like, "Hey, I can do this." And at the same time, I don't even know how I did it. And even to this day, I'm not even sure how I do it. Um, but I, I do. I mean, I have a better idea of what I'm doing now. But one especially when I first started it's like well here we go and within a few hours I had this composition somehow um, with my first dulcimer that was a total piece of shit the dulcimer the composition's fine but yeah so uh, but yeah it's like you know I just it's kind of like the first time I ever it's the same thing with some of the instruments like the first time I ever played it was the first time I recorded it to some degree and uh, and yeah so that's how that came about with the dulcimer. I, I, I mean, I sincerely love the instrument. I had seen it before, about 10 years before in Japan on the, on the street and kind of remembered that time. And then when I saw it again, I was like, I think this is the thing I'm going to need to use. Hmm. That, that's so surprising to me because I think most people would look at a project like this and just assume like, oh, this guy just like probably already played this instrument. And then in his head, he was just like, oh, how can I turn this like into like a metal band when it was really quite the opposite? Like the con the concept came first and you literally learned an instrument to make it happen. That is just way beyond any effort I would put into something, I feel like. <laughs> well, uh, actually, that is what happened. Yeah. And it's kind of similar with the other stuff that I've used to do. It's like. The harmonium is another one. Like the harmonium is a is a um, definitely a secondary instrument in the band. But again, it's like, what can I use that will sound appropriate for for the concept of the band that won't require me to spend three years figuring out? Because you know, there's some instruments like you know, like a keyboard is really easy to use in terms of getting a sound out of it. You push a note, push the key down, and it makes that note. There's like no, you can't push the key down wrong. Unlike a violin, where it's like you could somebody could show you how to make the note, and it'll take you like however many however long to actually not get it to sound terrible. Um, so keyboards are a really easy way. It's like if you understand how to compose, and you have to have that ability, um, and just knowing where the notes are, you can use it as a supplement, and it works really well. And so the harmonium at, at first was a great thing in that sense because it has a very inherent organic um, sound because it's, it's an acoustic instrument and used the way I wanted to use it. It's just for like, uh, it's for supplementary like mood support. Um, it was another thing that's like this, I can make this work right away and, um, and I can do, I can, it's like doing a simple thing well. 
um, was what it enabled me to do. And there's some other things that are used to uh, an even lesser degree, like the psaltery, that just enables you to do something simple um, well, and it just comes together and congeals into this thing that, become, that became botanist in this case. Do you ever get like weird reactions from people in the audience or people who talk to you who who don't know what the instrument is? Because I remember the first time I heard uh, a botanist song, I didn't know anything about the fact that it's being played on hammer dulcimer. So I just kind of assumed that it was just some weird guitar effect or something. And so do you ever find people that like see you playing then and are like, what the fuck is that? (laughs) Like, what is happening here? Yeah, it's... um there's a whole variety of responses. I mean, the obvious thing is when you started talking about is people see it live and it's like, I pull it out of the case and people are like, Whoa. Um, and it's particularly impressive when you see it from the side that you don't really get to see it that much in, when you're in the audience, when this, when the show is happening, because you can't really get, you can't really see the strings when you're in the audience because the strings are facing me and they're at an angle and it's hard to see them, but there's a lot of strings on that thing. And when people see that, it's like, look at all those strings, is what I think they're probably thinking of. And it's this weird <laughs> trapezoid box, and it's on legs. And and um, so, yeah, people were interested in it. And most people don't know what that is, and by name or even by sight. Um, so that's a common thing. Uh, another funny thing that you may not have anticipated in your question is, what people who do know what the hammer dulcimer is and in fact play it or have played it for quite a long time react to when they hear botanist. And this has happened a few times, either with me or with um, some of the guys who are in Southern California who were in the band who took like some lessons was like the dulcimer teacher or people would be like, Oh, cool. Um, where's the dulcimer? Like, in, like they'd hear a botanist track and they would say, where's the dulcimer? Hmm. And the answer is, it's the whole thing is the dulcimer, yeah, it's but everywhere. they can't tell because of the way it's processed and, and 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 distorted. So it's a little like I think if one could imagine never having heard an electric guitar ever, 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 and only being familiar. Let's say you're from the 15th century or the 17th century or something, and you're familiar with the acoustic guitar or whatever the version of it is at the time. And then someone says, hey, check this out. And it's whatever electric guitar you can want to play them. They might not be able to say, oh, that's a guitar. But it's kind of those taking for granted things that (laughs) botanist taps into a lot with its usage of instrumentation. Um, So it's kind of a funny response. Like, yeah, the dulcimer is everything that you're listening to. And that's a trip. Yeah, that's super interesting. But for you, John, like... Yeah, it's it's interesting to think about, like, when you said you first heard it, you thought maybe it was a guitar, because a fair amount of reviews that we get, people aren't really, you know, this is my critique of of journalists, (laughs) when they don't do their their research, but but that's fine. But then when when I'll read journalists, and they'll be like, the guitar, it's like, yeah, there's no guitar in it, but they think it's a guitar, and I don't know, is it, does it sound like it could be? What do you think? I I mean... When I step back from it, it sounds nothing like a guitar. I mean, it almost feels like we just so closely associate guitar to black metal and metal in general. And so, yeah, you just kind of jump to the assumption of of what you're familiar with. And even though, like, deep down, I'm sure I recognize that, like, this... This, this can't be a guitar. It's like what else? I'd never even heard of Hammer Dulcimer before, and your band was mm. the one that familiarized me with that instrument. And I mean, I guess I should have known a little bit better because I did grow up. Uh, I started playing the drums pretty young and got into band and played stuff like xylophone and Glockenspiel and stuff like that. That that's probably a little bit closer associated in some ways, but still, just like I think my brain was just in like. Oh, this is black metal, therefore guitar. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, it is, and it's you know it, to be fair, there's it's less all the time, but particularly one of the the big challenges, and even within my own brain when I started botanist was I had this intention to make a dulcimer sound like a guitar. It's just that a guitar that I could play the way that I wanted to play it, 
but that's not possible. Like there's all the sorts of technical reasons why you can't get it to sound like a guitar. Um, and, and especially like the guitar in my head is like, it's going to be, you know, at first I thought I'd make a grindcore record, which is even more ridiculous <laughs> in terms of <laughs> what grindcore sounds like. But my approach to the first couple records was, was grind in terms of the drums anyway. But like, but like the sound of grindcore is just like so, it's, it's not possible to do with what I was doing, but I didn't understand that. And along the way, it's been kind of a, a, like, that gets a little bit smaller. Like now I want to do this, but like, it's not a guitar. So you can't get it to sound like that. And it's, and, and, but then it's been replaced by it being hilarious. Like whenever I work with a new engineer or a new band member who, and it's often like, oh, they're playing bass in the band. And they're like, well, I'm going to bring all these effects. It's like, please don't, because yeah. it's not going to work. We're in the context with the dulcimer. It's going to sound, it works with a guitar, but it's not going to work with a dulcimer. And like I worked with Frederick Nordstrom, which is amazing. And it wasn't a big deal or anything, but, you know, there was definitely a learning curve for him to be like, oh, it's not a guitar, but it's presented that way. So I, he couldn't do all the things that he normally would just plug in to whatever Gothenburg band he would do or whatever, you know, band, mm. because it just wouldn't work. And it doesn't like there's all these pedals that they make for guitars that are amazing. And I was like, oh, it'd be so cool to use that. You put it on a dulcimer. It doesn't work. Yeah. Or it does kind in of a, a different way. Must have been kind of a fun challenge for him. I imagine like when you kind of get used to recording a certain way for a long time, that might get kind of old. So to have the opportunity to to kind of have to reinvent the wheel in a way is pretty cool. Um, it probably was. I mean, to be fair to him, he didn't get to track us. So it um, it, it would have been a lot more of a, a, an experience for him. But mm -hmm. it has to do a lot with effects that I think he would use normally or the way he would process it, that it just wouldn't necessarily work that way. Hmm. Okay. Well, I did want to ask you, too, going back to this whole idea of being approached by sort of a veteran hammered dulcimer players, if you will, do any of them like end up giving you shit and be like, you're playing it wrong or you shouldn't be playing it that way because they're so used uh to it? I, I don't know. To tell you the truth, I'm not entirely sure how much whatever hammered dulcimer community, hammered dulcimer um, community, <laughs> the hammered uh, dulcimer elite, <laughs> or or niches or where or what regions, um, know or care about botanists. The, the only way I can I can the only gauge I really have is. Uh, so James Jones is the man who um, made all the botanists dulcimers. And he told me that he went to some, like he goes to um, uh, instrument manufacturer, uh, not festivals, but basically like NAM, it's like um, a convention. Hmm. He'll go to whatever conventions and people come up to him like, I don't know how many people, but he'll let me know like, oh, people or person or whatever came up to me and says, oh, I checked out Botanist and it was really interesting. And that apparently there's some buzz even within the hammer dulcimer community, which again is that's cool. Not, you know, not really close. I mean, there's some guys that go on half pickups on the dulcimers, but they're still playing it in kind of a relaxed musical setting. Yeah. It's, you know, there'll be some fusion aspect, but it won't be what we're doing. Um, so, yeah, so I think, but I mean, it's probably, you know, without having heard this, like I never get sh your question. Do I get shit from people? I'm playing it wrong. No, but, um, but I'm sure it's kind of like if you play black metal to, um, I don't know, like a singer songwriter that you're like, what is this ungodly noise? So it's <laughs> probably like, yeah. Yeah. Well, we can't have this conversation without also bringing up the meme that is very much associated with your band because of the whole fiasco with Metal Archives that I've I've shared yeah. a number of times. In fact, that was something I think that actually ultimately caused us to start communicating, really, because you took notice of, yeah. of <laughs> us posting those. So further thoughts on being more or less blacklisted by Metal Archives because... Uh, of whatever i mean again i the joke is that it's just because you don't have guitars and maybe there is more going into it than that but i don't know if you have anything to say on that yeah 
Yeah, thank, thanks for all that promotion. I mean, the promotion was a, a really great thing. Like, so many people latched on to that and loved it and shared it. And, uh, and you know, just your continuing to support the band in different ways is like, hey, this, this, this is the kind of site that I want to give a little promotion back to and be able to, um, to do like this, this premiere and podcast. I think it's great. It's, it's an unusual opportunity, particularly with the podcast. Um, I'm not sure how many um, other sites that are like the common five to six premiere sites uh, have podcasts anyway. So as an aside, but um, so going on the metal archives thing, I use metal archives a lot. Uh, I think I'm using it a bit less nowadays. I'm, I'm starting to shift over to discogs more because discogs well has more music on it, but also you can listen to the music that you're looking up in the browser. You don't have to go to YouTube and check it out or whatever. So I quite like that. But your question is, is it a fiasco? Um, <laughs> I think as far as a fiasco goes, it's a pretty low grade fiasco. Yeah. Um, it's a great reason to make a meme. Yeah. Um, and that's rad. And I think that <laughs> in that sense, I probably benefited from not being on metal archives in that way. Yeah. Um, I think it boils down to really the amount of power that people are willing to give someone or something and based on that what their reaction to whatever happens is it's like metal archives is a great site it does a lot of work and the community that keeps it up and just updates everything and like you could look up pretty much like you could look up probably my obscure sort of prog power band that i did that never did anything <laughs> And it's and the shit's on there, like it's on there. I, somebody put that up there, and and that's great because if you want to look up some Lithuanian demo or something, like you can find it on there. You may not be able to even find that on Discogs, for example. So that's cool, and and necessarily it's the go-to look things up site. But at the same time, it's like, well, how much power? is being given to that site is being like, well, because everything's on there, it's therefore the Bible. Yeah. And it's a Bible. Um, but it's not, it's not like, it's not, they don't have the say to, and I don't even know if they'd even claim to have the say to it's like on their site. They're like, well, this doesn't count. I'm like, okay, well, yeah. it doesn't count. All right, fine. I, I don't know if it makes any difference really with botanists, success or fan base or anything because it's it's just it's there's a very decidedly not metal aspect about it but as um somebody once said what else is it but many or many people like what else is it but metal yeah and i, I would argue that there's a lot like lighter so to speak groups on the site that still qualify and you know sure. I, don't, I don't take it seriously uh, like i just like having fun with it and the meme just occurred to me one day and you know that's just a great way to just advertise stuff right now because people pass along memes a totally. lot more i mean realistically more than they pass along like demos and song premieres and stuff which is sad on some level but if hey if it helps get the word out then great but i yeah. do dislike that kind of gatekeeping side of it like that always irks me in anyone I talk to in the kind of larger metal community, if I feel like there's some level of like, and like you said, maybe they're not even intending on doing it. They're just trying to hold some sort of standard, but it just does sometimes yeah. feel like, well, that's not metal. And therefore like it, it doesn't get included. It's like not part of our community. And that just seems kind of shitty to me, but it's, it's whatever it's, it's fun to have fun with <laughs> Yeah. And it's, it's kind of, it's always a trip. Like I giggle inside. It's like when a band becomes really not metal anymore, but they've put out like, um, I'm trying to think of like, what would be a really good example of, of this? The first thing that's coming to mind, I don't even know why is like Beharit. Like Beharit is one of the most famous Finnish black metal bands of all time, but they put out a record that's basically like electronica mm. and, but that's on metal archive because they're Beharit, but that's not a metal record at all. Right. Makes like me think of Ulver, band. too. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Ulver is the best example. Ulver is the best example. Like, they didn't change their name. They totally changed their band. And they probably changed their band for people who 
are not like I, I only care about metal over personally. It's my taste for over is I only care about the metal over. Yeah. But since they stopped being a black metal band, they've changed so much from what I've checked out. It's like it's not even metal to not metal. It's metal to not metal to like four different things that they've changed to. And it's a perfect example. It's like that's still on metal archives because it's over. <laughs> but, yeah. but like, what is it like four fifths of the discography now it has nothing to do with metal whatsoever. Yeah. Well, and it also bothers me too, because the kind of the biggest thing that led me to start this site and expand into the podcast and the YouTube channel and everything in general is I really want to share new, innovative, weird stuff that like you don't already hear a thousand times. And so yeah. to me to like preclude the inclusion of something that uses some alternate instrument is is really kind of dumb. Like I, I would love to like go to a show and just be shocked to be like, whoa, they're playing some weird thing. Like another band that's been coming to mind a lot that sounds nothing like yours, but it just reminds me of the same spirit as author and punisher. Cause you've got this mm -hmm. like machinist, yeah. like building his own instruments more or less and like bringing a completely yeah. different aesthetic to industrial shows. And I just think that's the coolest thing. And I'm like, we need more of that, not less. <laughs> yeah. Is often Punisher on metal archives out of curiosity? I was just wondering that as I was saying that I've never checked to see if they are, but I, I, it would be interesting because technically there are, you could argue there are no instruments or that everything is an instrument. So that it's not middle music. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. Or even, yeah, it's, it's an, yeah, it's, it's weird how these lines get drawn. Yeah. Things get blurry. yeah absolutely. Well, yeah. But you're right. Author and Punisher, like when I've seen, like we played a show with them in San Francisco um, years oh, cool. ago, like half of, half of the experience is watching the guy manipulate his, his array. Yeah. And like, he has this, yeah, I mean, at the time, anyway, he had, like, um, a hand. It almost looked like a throttle. Like, yeah. I imagined it as a th <laughs> Like, he was piloting a, a jet or something like that. And it would be like, you know, balls to the wall, full systems go, or it'll like, ease back. And I don't know if that's exactly what he was doing, but that's what it looked like to me. And that image sticks in my head in terms of author and punisher. Like, he's got something in his mouth, whether that's accurate or not. And he's got this throttle, whether that's accurate or not. And it's kind of rad. Yeah, I I am such a sucker for musicians that are just doing stuff like that, just coming up with something really weird. And some people might call it a gimmick, but I'm like, hey, you remember it, though, right? And it's like keeping you interested. So, yeah, let's let's do a lot more of that. Um, I did want to yeah, ship. Big thing is, is it go ahead. Yeah, please go ahead. Go ahead and ship. No, no, no. Well, let me talk about the gimmick because it, it's a common thing, fairly common, that people will bring up the word gimmick in conjunction with botanist. Either it'll be it's a gimmick or it's not a gimmick or it's not just a gimmick. <laughs> <laughs> and and I can't on some way say whether that's accurate or not because to me personally, it's not a gimmick because this is how I'm creating music with botanists. Um and it taps into it taps into the thing we were talking about the much larger aspect of um, the the foregone conclusion or the take for granted aspect like metalist guitars and people don't question that because it's a foregone conclusion and that's fine but but the gimmick thing it's it's not um, and. The thing about it is, and it's kind of like with the author, author and Punisher topic, is I'm taking something and I'm trying to figure out how to do something different with it with the limitation that I have. It's like the limitation is set that it's drums, dulcimers, about plants, and there's other stuff to it, but it's got to be about that. And what I've learned about making art is when you just do anything, when you feel like you can just do anything and, and, and you're open to like doing whatever you want – it's a little bit diff more difficult to make art than when you say, these are my limitations and I'm going to maximize that because it gives you an en envelope to push. Um, and it enables me, I mean, just practically, I compose really well in a dulcimer. It works really well for however it's laid out, however my brain works. Um, like my skill set works really well for me. But the gimmick aspect is, is kind of like, 
yeah, would you say that about, I don't know, pick, pick a band. Would you say that about, um, like, Bolt Thrower? Bolt Thrower is one of my favorite bands ever. It's like, yeah, all their songs are about war. Is it a gimmick? I don't know if people really say that about Bolt Thrower. So, and then the, another thing that's kind of weird is when people will say that uh, botanist is ready or is expanding and maybe will include other instruments, which is also weird because it means to me that that person may not, not have embraced that they're taking for granted what like the cultural thing of like rock music is guitar based. And again, that's fine. But like, it's, it's like a, it's a foregone conclusion that people don't question that much. So it's like, would one say, Oh, the new iron maiden. Well, maybe someday they'll stop using drums, guitars and bass. <laughs> like no one would, no one would say that because that's ridiculous. And you know, it's like, I'm Bonus is not Iron Maiden, and it's like not even close. Like Iron Maiden is a hugely successful, accomplished band. Okay, but it's the point of no one saying, "Hey, you know, whoever like uh, Isaac Rabin, oh, maybe he'll stop playing violin someday." Like, but why? What? Like, but that's what he does. Um, so it's it's the gimmick thing and the dulcimer thing, and I think it ties in t- to some degree uh, to the Metal Archive bit of perception it's like what do you perceive um something to be and how is that perception holding you back or coloring your your i I don't know like the way you can receive something and your reaction to it and it it happens on all sorts of levels um i think that's all i have to say about (laughs) no that's fine (laughs) it's all very just fascinating too to think through all that but i did want to shift gears to so the new album I want to get a sense of kind of what is there a, a very specific concept to this one and your thoughts on what's different about this versus past releases and all of that. Okay. Well, <clears throat> this one was intended to be more open ended in terms of the theme. Like I wanted there to be a theme, but I wanted there to be it to be a little bit more open ended. Um, it had to do with when we had when I had the first thought of of it was on tour in 2017 in Europe. And I wanted to make a record with the guys that were on tour um, at the time. And I wanted everyone to be able to, I'm I'm specifically talking in this case about our singer at the time, uh, Sinoxalon, um, and to be able to give him the opportunity to write lyrics and do vocals, specifically the lyrics, to something that would be open-ended, would still be about botany, but then he could adapt to what he wanted to write about. And be one of those things where it's like not obviously about whatever he's writing about. It's under the guise of botany or the guise of something as broad as the ecosystem of a forest, but could have a lot of deep and inner meaning. So various things happened. It largely was that Sinoxalum left the band um, after our Japan tour because he decided to start a family. So because of that, I decided to do the vocals and write my own lyrics for the uh, the band because he wasn't going to be on the stage and and it would be more botanist if I did, did it uh, and it just it just felt like the right thing to do so so but the the concept remained the same and I really love it because redwood trees are my favorite thing uh, my favorite thing or my see, if someone says what's your favorite plant um, I would say redwood trees are my favorite plant I, I I really love redwood trees so doing something broad. Uh, thematically, I think makes it, I, I think it really works well in terms of a concept record. Like it doesn't have to be too specific or um, like there's no plot. Like uh, someone recently talked about it being a narrative. It's not a narrative. Like there's no plot, there's no characters, there's no development in the record. It's just about this thing and various aspects about that ecosystem. Um, so what's different about it is, well, there's there are different people on the record and and necessarily they bring different skill sets and abilities uh, to, to the whole. And like, obviously about like, you know, I got a guy playing bass. I, mean, I can't play. I, I do play bass on the record, but I'm not very good at it. Um, and I just do what I can within my, my ability, but having somebody that actually can play bass was great. Um, 
uh, having um, a drummer who's better than I am was was cool. Um, but I mean, largely, I think the two things that are different um, beyond that are is one, we went and got a major metal producer to make the record, which is makes a big difference uh, in terms of what it sounds like. And two, I'm uh, the vocals are a lot more forward in it, and that's just the way I think records are mixed in general. Like vocals are more forward, and they're more forward here. And in fact, he wanted to put them even more forward, which was too much. But um, and it's interesting to see reactions of on the vocals in terms of them being. It seems so far like people think that they're better, and they may or not be. They're just definitely louder, um, and they're more mixed as if it were like like at the gates like at you look at, at where most melodic death or popular like band metal it goes it's the vocals tend to be bigger than than bot bonus has always been consciously vocals are kind of buried this is the way i want it to be it's like this time let's do it a little bit differently like fuck it let's do it um and it's it's kind of this risk-taking thing because there's more singing in it like i'm tr trying to develop my singing ability to to greater degrees and maximize what my skill set is um and and see well how far can i push the ability that i do have into contributing to the music and uh and using that as a new experimentation and new uh, ability to grow um as a musician and for the band yeah the vocals definitely stood out to me first and foremost as i was listening to this one because i agree with you like in the past they've been a lot more buried they've been uh, I feel like the ratio of kind of harsh vocals to clean vocals uh, leaned a lot more heavily towards the kind of indecipherable harsh, yeah. harsh vocals. And it also stood out mm -hmm. to me and maybe I'm wrong, but it, it feels like you're, you're making a very specific choice with the clean vocals in terms of how you're approaching them. And I don't know if that that's true or not. Well, it's not, it's not that new, like what was going on in The Shape of He to Come isn't really that much different in terms of the clean vocals on ecosystem. What's, what's a little bit different is that the, vo the clean vocals on The Shape are, um, are, are more, are more um, they sink in a little bit more. Like they're not, they don't poke out as much. They're not, they're not as forward as on, on ecosystem. And there are a lot more of them actually, like, there are two people singing almost all the parts like uh Bezalith and I were singing all the parts on the shape and uh she was adding her own harmonies to stuff and there were way more layers per person like like almost all the vocals um on the shape are a total of like 12 layers like it's it, like everything's doubled and each of us singing two or three parts at once and it could get up to like 16 layers I think it can be as few as like four or six, but, but like on ecosystem, it's way more pared down. Like a lot of parts are just two layers. It's one part doubled. Um, and then it'll, when it gets into the, the harmony parts, it'll be up to three parts, but generally two parts. So it'll be like two tracks of vocals, four tracks of vocals or six track of vocals at the most. So it's actually toned down from the shape. It's just more presented up front. Um, and it's, and because of that, it's the way they were written and also the way they're most of the way they're mixed. It's more like these are lead vocals um, and they're not quite lead vocal level. as like if you look at a power metal record, like those are way louder in terms of the relative mix because they lead the song. And in Botanist, I'm still not entirely confident of like having uh, <laughs> melodic vocals lead the song as they do on like a power metal record or a pop you know, song, something like that. But I think that may be coloring a bit of what you're hearing. Um, but practically, yeah, they're just a lot more present. I mean, I hear that, but I'm also talking about like kind of the performance itself. I'm wondering if you approach this with like a mindset of I want these vocals to sound like this thing. I want them to remind people of X. Oh, well, I think... In, in my head, it's not anything new. Like I've always wanted to have clean vocals and I always have had some inclusion of them. They've just been a lot more buried again 
or they haven't been doing as much. They haven't been as dynamic. Like the first time I tried clean vocals was there's a, tr- a track called, um, uh, uh, is, what the hell is it? It's one of the songs on the second um, botanist record. And I want to call it Dendromicon, but it's not Dendromicon. I'll have to get back to you about that. So, but I've always considered, and somebody nailed it um, with the their perception of what the shape of heat it comes like. They described it as holy. I think it was Richter from uh, Toilet of Hell, and he does some other work here and there. But that was the intention with the record. It's like supposed to sound like the orthodox black metal, if you will, like the sort of like tapping into a religious aspect of the thing that's a genre. In this case, it's like the orthodox green metal, you know, if you want. Hmm. Um, and that was the intention. Like if it, it's not, it's, it's very little about actual botany. Like there's very little botany aspect to the shape of he to come. It's more about this talking about a Messiah that's coming and the, the pseudo religious aspect of the, the lore is what the focus is. So that talking about it being holy is largely what I've always wanted within botanists. Like there's a reverence to it. It's like the band is about treating nature as if it were God. Like nature is, in my opinion, the closest, like most tangible way we can interact with whatever the divine is. We can't understand what that is because we're limited beings, but we can interact with it by going out and being in nature because whatever the divine is, is causing this thing to naturally occur. And that's how we can like, that's the best like connection we can have to it. So having that aspect come through in the music um, is what I've always wanted. And I, you know, like my ideal sort of music is like, I'm in a cathedral by myself and there's a band playing in the basement and I can't see the band, but I can hear it. And it's reverberating through the cathedral is sort of one of my archetypes for like, Oh my God, that sounds like the best thing ever. So if botanist can embody that. And to me, it's like, if you can make sort of angelic harmonized choral things, be the vocals, um, that would fit in pretty well with that, um, with that imagery. And, uh, for better or for worse, it seems like I can kind of do that. So I'm I'm going to be I've been working at it and seeing how well I can get this to go um, and uh, and be a, a part of Bodice that'll that'll fit and, and grow the band. Yeah. Well, I think if that's the vibe you were going for, I think you did nail that because especially that last part you said about being alone in a cathedral listening to this, I very much have been associating these vocals with like kind of like a boy's choir almost like it, it just reminds uh-huh. me it's very church like it's very somber and yeah holy's a, a good word for it in fact i was even picturing like boy it would be kind of cool if they like actually got like a boy's choir on one of these songs and like had the, yeah, the full uh, chorus uh, going uh, yeah so would, the name of the song too is dota Cathion. it's a, a minute 18 song and there's like some chanting on it and that was my first attempt at like, eh, let's have some of this sort of wah, wah kind of vocal thing. Um, and just kind of ran with that. Um, yeah. So it, sometimes I wonder if it's going to end up sounding like a barbershop quartet. And like, oh, yeah, okay, I don't know. <laughs> Definitely Maybe. not. It's like, that's not my intention. I don't think I want it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and that stuff is awesome, but you know, it's not what I want. Was there anything else new that kind of played into this record that maybe hadn't been part of the process as much, or maybe something that was going on for you that found its way into the, either the, the lyrics or the, the sound of it in general? Well, I think it's something that was different was, let me make sure this is correct. Yeah. It's, this is the first time I've written the music to somebody else's drums like people have written, so like the shape of you to come, like I didn't write a single note of those dulcimers. Like that's all, that's all Dylan Neal. Um, and uh, Robert Chang wrote the interlude dulcimer parts and they wrote, they co-wrote the, um, 
the first track, which we named um, Praise Azalea, The Adversary, like they wrote that as an intro to all our live shows when they were in the band from 2013 through 2015. It's like, we have to have this on the record. It's really, really good. So I didn't write a single note of those dulcimers, but they wrote all the dulcimers to my drums, um, which is how Botanist almost always goes. Like the music gets written to the drums. Like, like a bunch of drums are made and then it was like, okay, let's write the music. And so that's what happened this time too, in that I told Deturus, which is our live and you know drummer on this record, like, hey, can you record a bunch of drums? And, and, and again, it's something not to be taken for granted because not everyone can do that. Even drummers are like, just write a bunch of drums and yeah. record it. And they won't know what to do. It, it's like, just play drums, man. You know, I'm just like, <laughs> have, have an idea of how you're arranging it. Just play. No, it's, no. It's, like, it's, it's interesting to run into things. It's kind of filed into the, the category of things that you can do that you take for granted that everybody else can do. But then it turns out that they can't. And mm -hmm. then it's like, wow, that thing that I can do that seems so easy, why can't others do it? And it's not just me. It's like, I'm sure, John, there's something about that you can do that like you take for granted that the other people can't do. Oh, yeah. Anyway, so that's the thing. Yeah, I've, I've talked yeah. about it here before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so um, luckily, the tourists can. And, uh, and he came up with uh, a bunch of stuff. And it's kind of pop oriented and not in terms of the playing but in terms of the arrangements like the arrangements are fairly simple in um in ecosystem which is great because i told him going in it's like listen i don't know if you've ever heard at the gate slaughter the soul and i don't want it to sound like at the gate slaughter the soul but this is how i want it to be similar in at the gate slaughter the soul is none of the songs are longer than four minutes like there are three to four minutes and i think it's a very important part of why it was as popular as it was like it, mm -hmm. they're not long-winded songs and there's other aspects about it you know, there's so many aspects about why that as that album was so seminal and i said particularly because we're going to get um and i think i knew i was getting frederick nordstrom at the time i don't remember but maybe Maybe I got Frederick Nordstrom because of the whole, like, I want this to be like our melodic death record or something. <laughs> so don't make the songs any longer than this, but don't make them any shorter than that either. And so he basically did that and then made songs that, you know, arrangement wise, again, are, are not particularly complicated. Um, and that went really well with the plan of this record was intentionally made to be played in its entirety on stage. Like I, I wanted to tour on this record and, you know, for the next year or two or whatever, and be like, okay, our set is ecosystem one, like song one through song eight to the end, all the interludes, which would put us at about 40 minutes with, you know, getting on stage, pausing, you know, having a drink or whatever you have to add all that time. And then with whatever time left over, we would play like, um, uh, the, 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 the new long song off of the hammer of botany reissue mm -hmm. and then close the roast in the dead, because that's our, our closer. People like a roast in the dead as a closer. And that would be our set. And it was like the, the intention of having botanist live be an even more separate entity from botanist solo and even have like the solo stuff start to be more and more phased out from the stage stuff. And the stage stuff would be made because it's written for the stage, which to allow the solo stuff to be even more like you couldn't even do that on stage. Um, so that was, there was that intention going into it and all those aspects together. It's like, let's not make the song super crazy long. Let's make it like bite sized, like chunks of, of like songs. And that's what happened. Um, and uh, so I think that's what you're asking me about. How is it going into um, what was the intention and what was different about it? And and speaking of live performances, do you have like touring plans lined up yet? No, we did. Um, <laughs> we were supposed to be on tour. I'm not even supposed to be talking to you right now. I'm just, I'm supposed to be on tour. Uh -huh. um, but no, that we yeah, we were supposed to be touring um, from mid September to about a week from now in Europe um, on this record, but it fell through, um, and it sucked because the planning for the tour started sort of two years before the tour started with like, Hey, we need to make this record and we have this much time to do it and let's get, get it together. And, um, 
And that aspect sucks that the tour fell apart. It doesn't mean yeah. that like it'll still be another tour sometime, but it's like, wow, we have this record ready to play on, you know, but we can't play, <laughs> play it right now. Um, also, we don't You're really like have a band. Go. Yeah, well, we don't have a singer right now because our singer, you know, he had decided to have, to have a child. So, um, <sighs> what so a there's, selfish there's bastard. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, uh, it's it's he's he's, he's going to be happy, or at least yeah, he's going to grow as an adult course. person. And, and I don't know if you have kids. I don't, but yeah, uh, it's, I do. Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> they, okay, they, they yeah. eat up your so, time pretty um, quick. <laughs> And so, you know, he's, he's getting to that, like, initial paralysis or, like, frantic, like, I don't know what it's going to be like. Maybe my, my life will be, you know, whatever, you know, and he, he's not, he's not freaked out, but he's just like, like, hey, do you think you could even do, like, a local show or, you're, like, we get paid to go down to L.A. to play, uh, like, a, a yeah. gallery or something? Like, I don't even think I can do that. And he's, yeah. you know, probably because he doesn't even know what to expect. Yeah, there's a lot of adapting, I will tell you. I mean, literally, I record this, like, on a lunch break at the office, like, because I don't have time to do it at home. So that's just, that's that's just the way things are. <laughs> okay. Well, be conscious of your time. I didn't know you were on your lunch break. So, um, so yeah, but, uh, yeah. So I think in terms of, um, the, the, the concept, like it was a very, from the onset planned out, like, meticulously like okay well it's going to be for stage so it's going to have to be like this or try to be like this um uh and just the, the whole planning is very well planned out um for for the for its intention for the record okay uh speaking of things that kind of came up as you were recording this album and sort of new directions you were trying new approaches are there things you're kind of excited to do next time around as you start writing again like are there things you haven't done with botanist that you're like really wanting to do um yeah i mean this is kind of stuff that i don't necessarily even want to take to have you look behind the curtain uh <laughs> let's see what can i tell you what i can tell you is the tourist gave me 15 tracks of drums oh wow and and i wrote because i basically told him like i want you i told him to write like way more than we needed because i wanted to have the luxury to pick and choose the best stuff at least for the cohesiveness of ecosystem so and then one of those tracks is abiotic the um the, the sort of like pseudo dark folk uh, song that we have on the record, the second to last one. Um, he didn't write on drums. Like I just pieced the drums together from his samples. Like he made samples of the kicks and the snares and every instrument. That way we could, if we needed to replace them, we had a good sample of it. I just took all the samples. I'm like, I'm going to write a song with these samples. And I just pieced it together by hand. Um, what you're hearing isn't that he re-recorded it. Uh, that way, it's actually him playing drums. So we have 16 tracks of drums, and there are eight tracks on ecosystem. So I'll let you uh, come to the conclusion. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I hear you. So there's more, there's more material um, that's largely in the same. That was all record. Uh, Dulcimer wise was all recorded at the same time. That'll be released later. Okay. Um, but in terms of the solo stuff. Like I have, um, okay, sorry, before I get to the solo stuff, uh, like the current, like Deterus and, um, and, and I obviously, and, um, uh, our, our current bass player, um, want to make another record and we have a concept in mind and it's just a question of Deterus recording and I'll record to that. I want to make another record with the two, the two guys in, in um, Orange County who are the guys in Thief. I don't know if you've seen Prophecy put out a band called Thief. That's, uh, you know, it's one of those botanist related bands. And I, I hope that as they get bigger, it'll be less and less botanist related. It'll just mm. be their own thing. But um, they were the two guys that wrote all the dulcimers on um, The Ship of You to Come. I want to make another record with them. Uh, and then there's another, like, Iron in the Fire I have with a record I've made with a singer in England that I want to have, like, a doom singer sing on a, a like a doom oriented botanist another doom oriented botanist record and then there's like three or four solo records that all have a very specific wow. not only you know concept but 
that have a specific, I try to make it, especially with the solo records, like there's a different recording aspect or instrumentation layering aspect while still being within the drums, dulcimers, and about plants. But like, what else can you do that's atypical? Like I try to figure out what other people aren't doing, and then I do that. Um, uh, or that's not like the first time it's ever been done, but like people don't generally do this thing and I'm going to do that and for better or for worse, see what happens. Uh, so like drums for all that stuff were recorded like three years ago. Like I just did a ton of drums. I have like three, three hours worth of drums that are meant to be on these like three or four or whatever records that I'm going to be making. I've already made one of them. I have two or three more to go. Um, and, uh, and I don't want to leave, kick, kick, let the cat out of the bag. It's not a very super like, man, man this is going to happen. Like, oh, like awesome uh, tidbits of information. Like, yeah, I'm keeping it under wraps, I'm, I'm afraid to say. But uh, you'll just have to find out when it comes out. Okay. I'm excited to hear about yeah. it. You know, as you were talking, yeah. too, it was making me think about, I had a conversation on here with Doug Moore of Piron and Seputus and Weeping Sores, and we were talking about having trouble sitting still and just doing nothing. Are you <laughs> somebody like that where you just have to keep busy? Um, I do. It's a good and bad thing. Like it's, it's good to be able to look at it and go, Hey, I really need to be able to uh, not do something. Just sit there is really good. And and it's good in, in the case of like, you know, this, this aspect of life is bullshit. And um and seeing it as bullshit, and it's, and I think it's, you know, socioeconomically, like, it, it's a very white, it's a very white thing, like Western white person thing. And I think it's a particularly wet, uh, like Western white male thing. It's like, you got to be doing something all the time. It's like, well, you actually don't. Um, and like people that um, use business as um, a way to show how like valid they are, I think is, is, is can be fairly misguided. But but I'm, I'm getting a little bit more philosophical than I think you're asking. But in terms of music, <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely love it that I can't sit still. Like, I love it because it's like, it's, it's the most important thing that I do. It's the most, like, validating thing that I do for my own self. It's kind of like, it's the best form of therapy that I can imagine um, that, I, that, I, that I've ever been involved in. And it also has this incredible um, joy and affirmation because it's like tapping into the very core of my expression. Like I have a lot of ability to express, but there's kind of a primordial, really deepest um, energetic form of like the pure essence of, or a pure essence of my expression that I get to tap into to the degree that it comes from a place that I don't even understand and I'm not even sure who or what is expressing itself through me. And when I, when I really get that impression, it's, it's, it's like magic. It's amazing. Um, and so it's like, I have an arc. It's kind of like I'm a writer. It's kind of like if I was somebody, you know, you take like JK Rowling writing her books and she's like, I had the story. I need to tell it. And she wrote all those books in not a very long amount of time. And it's a little like that. It's like I have an arc, or at least it's a musical arc, and I have to finish that arc. And I don't really have any time to waste. And getting caught up in, like, I'm supposed to be busy doing this bullshit. Like, no, actually, I'm really not. Um, it's like the bullshit is ne sometimes necessary in terms to support being able to be an artist, but I really need to be doing art because that's really what matters. And all that other stuff is just like artifice. You know, it's like art versus artifice thing. Um, and uh, botanist is art. And uh, a lot of the other busy work is artifice. I definitely respect that. Uh, and that's, I think, something just in general that, you know, even the instrumentation aside that draws me to your music. And I think some of my favorite bands in general is just that sense of passion and genuineness and just it's it's real so i i deeply respect you for doing that um 
We're going to do a little track premiere here, but before we do that, I want to ask you the question I always like to ask guests on the podcast. Are there, is there another underground metal musician out there that you feel like deserves more respect and attention that you'd like to shout out? Well, I don't know if it's going to be more respect or attention. Um, he's certainly not the most famous one, but I think my single fa- uh, favorite metal musician in the world is Alexander von Mehlenwald. Does that ring a bell? No, it does not. Okay. Um, he ha- Does the Ruins of Beverest ring a bell? Yes. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay. If, okay so Alexander von Mehlenwald is the guy who does the Ruins of Beverest, and it's, it's a one-man project. And as far as one man black metal projects go, he's my hero. Like whenever I listen to his stuff, it's like, how can I get it to be more like this while still being bought? It's like the level of detail and subtlety to what he does and all his vocal layering and everything is incredible. It's so good. And he's so good at writing and playing everything that he does. And it's not, it's not like a show off thing. It's just like, it's just so well crafted and thought out and put together and meticulous. And it goes way back to him. He used to be in a band called um, Nagelfar. Like there are two yeah, Nagelfars. Yeah. There's the Swedish one and the German. The German one is by far the better one. And, uh, and he was the drummer in that band. And I think he might've done the vocals on the last record. I don't remember, but that band is so good. And everything he basically gets involved in is better for him being in like even he's in this like okay i won't get into it but 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 anyway he's my favorite metal musician and people should be checking out his his stuff more or at least recognizing that who this guy is is pretty rad awesome that's a good one all right so we're gonna do the first time premiere of the track harvest man and Mm -hmm. i thought maybe it'd be good for you to kind of share some thoughts just on this track in general before we do that. Sure. Okay. So Harvest Man is, uh, so again, ecosystem is eight tracks and each track has something to do with the ecosystem of a redwood forest, um, in the Pacific Northwest and to some degree in the, in California. So a Harvest Man is an insect and people incorrectly presume it's a spider because it looks like a spider. It's got like a body and it's got eight legs, but what's different about it, what sets it apart from being a spider is um, it doesn't have uh, two parts to its body. It doesn't have sets of eyes. It just has two that work as turrets that look largely on the side. Um, its legs aren't all the same length. It doesn't spin a web and it doesn't have any venom. So it doesn't like spin a web and like consume um, its prey in that way. Um, they're a lot. Um, they're basically harmless spider like creatures that are an intrinsic part of um, redwood forest ecosystems. Um, and they're, and they, and they hang out in, in herds. Like there's like hundreds of them that just sort of hang out um, and exist together. Um, and uh, yeah. And, and it was a really cool uh, topic to write a song about. And uh, I think, I think that's, uh, that's uh, yeah, there's my intro. Cool. Are they also known as daddy long legs? They are, which makes it even more confusing because people call them daddy long legs, but then they also talk about like the spiders that you find in your basement. Yeah. That are basically like tiny little bodies and they have these huge, really long legs. legs yeah. Those aren't harvest men, but they're also called daddy long legs. And so it gets really confusing. It's like, oh. wait a minute. Like, what? Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm looking at a picture <laughs> of, I looked up harvest men now and, and I'm like, no, that's, yeah, that's not what I grew up with. Because I grew up with what you're, yeah, what you're talking about with the little body and the the big long legs. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, cool. Well, it's a great track and I'm really excited to to be the first to share it. And thank you so much for giving me the honor of doing that and taking all the time to do this. Any final thoughts before I kind of play us out with that? No, I hope you enjoy the track. And thanks for all the support, John. Yeah, absolutely. Anytime. And don't be a stranger. I'm always happy to have people back on here. So when when all that new secret stuff, when you're uh, <laughs> when, yeah, you're, sure. um, when, you're, you. when your end game to your Infinity War comes out, then we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about that. Yeah, right. All totally. right. Thanks a lot, man. Appreciate all you. Right, man. All right. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye.
And that'll do it for another episode of Trench Talk. Thank you, as always, for listening. Once more, if you have not already, please do subscribe. And also remember that this podcast is available on multiple platforms. It's on YouTube, iTunes, CastBox, and BitChute. Also follow us on social media, sign up for the email list if you really want to make sure you don't miss anything because we all know that the algorithms for Facebook and whatnot are kind of garbage and they're they're not really good at giving you the stuff that you're looking for. Um, regardless of what platform you're on to, please do also subscribe to the YouTube channel because I also post all kinds of videos and other content there from reviews to retrospectives and things of that nature. And finally, Please, please do consider if you keep coming back and you really enjoy this as a part of your kind of metal listening experience, then consider going over to our Patreon or Subscribestar and donating to us there. Just a dollar a month. Like your couch change makes a huge difference and it helps me cover the overhead costs of hosting the podcast, getting equipment, all that kind of stuff. Um, So I'd be infinitely grateful if you did that but links for all of that once more down in the description but that'll do it for now flight of icarus signing off i will see you in the trenches